<laughs> okay, it's getting it's Friday. He's getting yeah. upset. It's Merry Christmas, good. everybody. Not actually Friday. It's not actually Friday. It's <clears throat> last Tuesday. Merry Christmas, one and all. It's Dennis Lawson. Let's do it. Absolutely. Okay. Well, the caffeine's going. He's established himself as a great actor on stage and screen. He's a director and producer. And I wanted to know, firstly, what drew him to the craft? Well, uh, it's interesting because uh, it's, it's tied up with what I'm doing at the moment. Uh, when I was um, three, four or five years old, I was brought up in this little town in Scotland in Perthshire called Creef. And um, it's just 6,000 people, a farming town, that kind of thing. But my family were Glasgow. And, and my mother had five brothers, um, my father had two sisters, so I had a lot of cousins and a big kind of family. We used to have big family parties and things like that. And whenever uh, we did have parties, everybody got up and did something. Um, and it, it's a sort of Scottish, maybe Irish thing too, right? And it was like, you're next up, what are you doing? It wasn't, oh, I'm shy, I can't know, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. So it was like that. Nobody had to, you know, I didn't hang back, I was right in there. And you know, I'd have like, um, I had a, an, one uncle who could do like a 15 minute spot with comic songs and harmonica, another uncle on the spoons, I don't know, or the bones. And so, and everybody, you know, I don't, uh, another uncle who was a drummer, one played piano. So that was all in the family. And my grandfather, my mother's father, was full of kind of Victorian poems and music hall patter and stuff and funny wee eccentric dances. And we discovered a few, well, some years back, we went to where he was brought up in Newcastle, which is where he's from. And he was literally, his house was straight across the street from a music hall, literally across the street. So he must have been in and out there all his childhood. So when I was that age, four or five years old, I wanted to be Danny Kaye, Jerry Lewis, Donald O'Connor, those guys that I saw in the movies. And it never went away. And I wanted to be an entertainer kind of song and dance man kind of thing. And um, because I was in this little town with no clues or anything, it wasn't until I was 14 years old that a friend of mine, a school friend of mine said, uh, mentioned this thing called a drama school. I'd never heard of it. That's how cut off we were. I said, oh, what's that? Well, you go there and you st study acting. And I said, oh, well, I'll do that. That's what I'll do. So the simplicity of youth, you know, well, I'll just do that, you know. So I, that's what I, that's what I did, and that's, how, that's what drew me into it. And let me just throw something else in here for those Star Wars fans. Um, because I was so kind of didn't really know what I was doing, I was 17, I auditioned for a couple of drama schools and didn't get in. Mm -hmm. So I went, I had a friend of mine starting in journalism in Dundee, and I went to see him, and I discovered this little amateur company in Dundee. So I joined them, got a job just to keep me going, and I did like six or seven productions with that company. The leading sort of light of that company was called Ian McDermott. Ah. Yeah. Um, who plays the emperor these days. So um, Ian and I both uh, auditioned for Glasgow Drama School on the same day. Ah. And I remember coming out with him and standing on the pavement outside the drama school. We shook hands and said goodbye, and I watched him walk up the road, and I thought, I'll never see that guy again. And we both got in, this, we both got in, we trained for three years together, shared a couple of flats together, and you know, yeah, wow. the rest is history, yeah. Over his illustrious 50 plus year career, Dennis has worked with some legends of stage and screen. Laurence Olivier, to, to just name drop one. I did, that's right. I did, I'd, I'd done quite a lot of theatre up to that point. I was very busy um, in different things. Then I hit my first good agent. And suddenly I was doing The Merchant of Venice on television with Laurence Olivier and, the, and directed by Jonathan Miller. It was quite a culture shock, you know, uh, but he was, he was lovely to me. He was very nice to me. And um, it, it was a great experience, you know. And, and then from then on, it rolled on, television, movies, you know. To name a few, Dennis has starred in Hornblower, uh, Bejeweled with Jerry Hall, Sensitive Skin with Joanna Lumley, Broken with Tim Roth and Killian Murphy. Earlier on than that, you know, 
uh, for instance, the year 76, mm. I did two movies in France that year before this thing called Star Wars suddenly yeah, yeah. come up. And I'd worked with um, Sir Ralph Richardson on um, Man in the Iron Mask, uh, Richard Chamberlain, uh, Patrick McGowan. Um, and then I did an extraordinary kind of movie called Providence by a French director called Alain René, and it was his first film in English. He was very celebrated. And I worked with Dirk Bogart in that, Elaine Stritch, Ellen Burstyn, David Warner. Um, but I, w I had a few scenes with Bogard, and I, I had learned a lot from him. My God, he was yeah. fantastic. And corresponded with him for a few years afterwards. Right. Know. Yeah. And of course, Local Hero. Oh, yeah, there you are. Stella Cassidy. Yeah, and with Burt Lancaster, too. And that was, Bob McKay. Yeah, oh, boy, that I was very, much. very special experience. Very. Yes. When you do work with people like Burt Lancaster and, um, and Olivier, and um, you, you, well, for me, you just keep your eyes and ears open. And I learned a lot from watching them, right. how they approach the craft of filmmaking as an actor, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, for instance, Dirk Bogard would come on to the set in Paris every day and shake hands and say good morning to every member of the crew every day. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen that before. And so he, he made sure he included everyone in with him, in, yeah. which is how it works, you know. So there's stuff like that, you know. On top of this impressive list of roles, I had to ask Dennis about his directorial experience as well. I, I directed, um, what was useful was I made, the first thing I did was I made a short film that I adapted from a Chekhov short story called The Bass Player. And then um, I adapted, um, an Ian McEwan short story called Solid Geometry. And um, there was funding in Scotland f to make short films at that point. It was about a half hour, 40 minute piece. And um, so I got that funding. And then I thought, um, maybe uh, I I'll just run this past Ewan and see what he thinks. Because I don't want him to watch it and go, why didn't you ask me to do this? <laughs> you know? So anyway, I said, look, have a look at this. I've got the money, whatever, la la. So he had a look at it and he went, and so he did it with me. So I directed him for the first time, and that was just, just great fun. It was lovely. Is it difficult with directing family members? No, or? no, no. It was dead. It was dead easy. Well, we have a very close relationship, you know. And I, and then I um, uh, I directed him on stage um, in a play called with a snappy title of Little Malcolm and His Struggle Against the Eunuchs. Yes. Very funny play set in Huddersfield. Um, and we had a great time doing that. Yeah. It was fabulous, you know. And then I went on and directed, you know, I directed probably half a dozen, six or eight plays over the years, you know. Yeah, yeah. So as we can all agree, Dennis has had one hell of a career. But what we want to know is, what was it like on Star Wars? Well, it was, um, again, go back to 1976. I did these two movies in France. And I, yeah, I'd met George. Before I went out, he, uh, he made, he, obviously he met loads of young actors, you know. And I just chatted with him in a room in Soho. And my, my, my impression was you got marks out of 10, <laughs> you know. And um, I don't know quite what happened, but um, uh, I d he did, they didn't offer it to me. That was fine, off I went to France. And I came back and suddenly got a call saying, could you do Star Wars, in fact, would you do it? I said, I went, oh, uh, yeah, okay, why not? Yeah, sure. So um, it was quite kind of last minute thing. Um, so it kind of came out from left field a bit. So while a few actors play various roles across the trilogy, uh, whether it be a Stormtrooper, a Snowtrooper, or, or Dennis's character was kept on through all three films. Look at the size of that thing. You know, doing the first one in 76, we had no idea what we were in. I don't even know if we saw a full script, probably not. Yeah. Um, and, um, but it was, it was great fun. We just sat around in those orange um, jumpsuits and, um, outside the soundstage in Elstree and chatted away. And um, there was a lot of young, young guys, you know, and with Mark and Mark Hamill and stuff. And, um, and it was good fun and kind of weird and... Um, uh, yeah, it was it was great. I'll never forget seeing uh, probably the cast and crew screening maybe in a huge cinema in Leicester Square in London, and that first shot where that yeah. ship what's it called that ship came across the top of the camera. I'm like, 
my God, I've never seen a shot like that in my life. And the, also the quality of the sound was amazing too. So they broke a lot of ground. I mean, George is some kind of genius, I think, I mean, yeah. what, what he did yeah. there. And um, it's the first time I'd ever heard the term computer, computer camera, computerized camera. Oh. No one had ever, you know, what the hell's that, you know? Uh, so, um, yeah, it was quite, uh, it, it was quite something when it, you saw it put together. But my God, what were they in? This is incredible, you know? Yeah. And as if being in all three films of the original trilogy wasn't enough, Dennis got asked to come back one last time for The Rise of Skywalker by J.J. Abrams. And that was very touch and go. Yeah. Because um, I tend to be very busy and um, uh, it's very unusually J.J. Abrams got in touch with me directly, which is not, not, not usual. No. In fact, I got in touch with my agent. I said, can you just make sure this is not a wind up? <laughs> he said, no, no, it seems anyway. I was talking to JJ and he, I said, yeah, I'd love to, of course, fantastic. And um, they wanted me for five days on the shoot. Mm -hmm. And I was in a play at that point and then immediately going to direct a play. Uh, and I said, here's my schedule. And he came back and said, oh, I don't think we can do this. And I went, come on, come on, JJ, come on. <laughs> We can do this, come on. And so the reason it's such a brief appearance yes. is we could only squeeze one day out of wow. my schedule and theirs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which, was, uh, which was frustrating, but it was nice to go back on the set. It was great yeah. fun. Yeah. Great fun. Nice flying, Lando. Great interview there from uh, Dennis. I could have sat there and talked to him all day. If you haven't seen any of Dennis's work, like Local Hero, Go and watch it. It's a independent film that was made in in the eighties. In fact, it is forty years old next year, the same as Return of the Jedi. Yeah, I encourage you to go and see him on stage or watch any of his plays. He is a great actor. If it wasn't enough to sit down and have a chat with a legend, the star himself, we've got a little something for you. So Merry Christmas to all you Hyperdrive members and welcome to this uh, Hyperdrive exclusive. Merry Christmas. I suppose you're wondering why we're doing a second signature edition with Dennis Lawson. Well, firstly, it's not an A&H helmet. It's a Return of the Jedi helmet. And Return of the Jedi is 40 years old next year. So this is Red Leader. So firstly, let's look at A New Hope and maybe we can find some of the differences. So to start with, Dennis was red two in A New Hope. Now this is actually my one. So when we actually went to see him for the first time, and we show him what we were producing, as we always do with uh, any of the signature editions, Dennis was kindly enough to sign this one for me. The difference is you can see in the paint straight away. There's the line goes across the base at the bottom. There's the trident at the front, which has a black line over the crest at the front there, whereas the A&H one is just left plain. And again, it's weathering and damage. Okay, the, the other noticeable difference about these two helmets is, again, the microphone. You'll notice the A&H one has the mouthpiece there. P section of rubber just placed just over the nose there on the Return of the Jedi helmet. So both of these helmets do actually get used in Return of the Jedi. Uh, this one gets repurposed, uh, another actor's wearing it, as the X-Wing that flies 
into the Death Star following Wedge Antilles and the Millennium Falcon. Uh, and it's the first one to explode as it travels through the inner workings of the uh, Death Star. See if you can see if you can find it. So there you go. This is the new signature edition, 40th anniversary, Return of the Jedi hyperdrive exclusive Red Leader helmet. So make sure you're on our mailing list and make sure you join the hyperdrive on Facebook. It's a great group, great community on there and be one of the lucky ones to get hold of the first 40th anniversary Return of the Jedi helmet from RS. Copy gold leader. I'm already on my way out.